I like this room. Yeah, it's, it's, I haven't done your podcast yet, so. Oh, oh, this is the first time. Yeah. All right, yeah. welcome. Yeah. Well, see, see, Barrett was talking talking shit about it the last time he was on. Like, oh, I'm not good enough for the TV show. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> here I am on the podcast again. I'm Arizona Family political editor Dennis Welch. Dennis, fake news, Welch. Try to tell the truth. And this is the Politics Unplugged podcast. Dennis, if you have a problem with substance abuse, I am more than willing to talk to you anytime you need. And welcome back for another edition of the Politics Unplugged podcast today, joined by Barrett Marson, who's our resident Republican today. Just say hi. Bit. Say hi, Barrett. <laughs> uh, hello. Happy Good everyone. Friday to you. We tape on Fridays. Good Friday? I'd say the best Friday. <laughs> and Democrat Roy Herrera. Hello, Roy. How well, are you? I'm really good. This is my first time on this podcast, so I don't even know what's going to happen. I don't know what to Dude, expect. this week has just been a lot. Can I just say, uh, Radio Land, uh, Podcast Land, whatever we call you people out there, can't see this, but I am looking at one of the most disgusting coffee mugs I have ever seen. That thing hasn't been washed maybe in they can six see it months? i don't know i don't oh. know barrett okay. they can see this yeah look at I, that's got thanks, more thanks. Com- that's coffee stains than well i, uh, I hope say. you enjoy your last appearance on our podcast <laughs> thank god oh thank god <laughs> <laughs> can i go back to the tv show <laughs> You've been banned, yeah, sir. Seriously. But then you have to put a coat on if you go to the TV show. Uh, you know what? And it's, pants. Yeah, and pants. So you can't, see, you you can't see this pants. unless you look under the table. You know, Bear is just Rod declaring Stewart. war on pants Rod in fashion today. Hot legs. No, good God. Okay, all right. All right, let's rein this back in here. It has just been a crazy busy week. I mean, I'm just going over a few things here. We had crazy like a weird press conference with you know a noted accused fake elector anthony kern outside of a courthouse but he wouldn't say why he was at the courthouse outside well, we uh, let me oh, run this some I'm of sorry. this down we've had the house the house voted to create an ad hoc panel to investigate chris mays for malfeasance and not co- and not following the law this of course comes after a similar another investigation launched by anthony kern in the senate of his judiciary committee to look at chris mays and the job she's doing doj announces that an ohio man is headed to prison for threats that he made against uh, Secretary of State Katie Hobbs. And the, Arizona, the, the state GOP is selling its headquarters in downtown Phoenix about nine months after they bought the thing. But they say it has nothing to do with any kind of financial troubles. Mm-hmm. It's all strategic. However, the big news of the week, let's start with this. Carrie Lake admitting, basically admitting in court that she defamed Stephen Richer, Maricopa County recorder, and says, okay, um, but you need to prove damages now. Um, That seems like the big story of the week. Let's start there. Barrett, you're chomping at the bit here. What what, what do you make of this? Uh, No, I just don't want you to hit the table anymore. It creates a lot of noise. It's a producer now, too. Yeah. Wow. Uh, So, wow, Dennis, I think you've framed this all wrong. Uh, Carrie Lake just doesn't want to participate in these bogus sham lawfare uh, battles. Okay. And so she hasn't admitted anything. She, in fact, says she did not uh, defame Stephen Richard, and Stephen Richard is just being a big old baby. So, uh, you know, I I think she's going to stand by her comments. In fact, she was in a... TV interview and and on a radio show recently where she stood by her comments and I think uh, I think she's happy about that. Now, will she be declaring bankruptcy sometime soon? <laughs> Roy, I, I have a feeling she will, but that's all just in furtherance of, you know, the real uh, telling. Well, well, telling well, it well, Bear, let's ask, ask the actual attorney at the table. <laughs> oh, whether, I, uh, what, 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 I, whether... law, I got my law degree from Law and Order University. I put that up against ASU anytime. <laughs> well, you, saw, you solve the case every time. Right? Did you get your law, law degree from that same online college that, a, that U of A bought? <laughs> 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 let, 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 let's ask Roy. 
<laughs> Essentially, like from a legal point of view, Carrie Lake said, I'm not going to dispute any of the accusations right. that that uh, Stephen Richard has said. And, and, and Stephen Richard has said that she has defamed me and my reputation by by spreading lies about me and how he, uh, so, you know, supposedly had rigged the elections that uh, and, and her race, which she lost for governor. Again, she did that without any proof. But that's the part of the defamation case. So essentially, in a legal term, she is admitting correct or is it is, am i misunderstanding is she is admitting no. that she defamed richard now all they're left to do is argue over the damages that, that's right i mean that's how i would interpret it i mean it, I, it, first of all let me just say how extraordinary this is i mean she requested a judge to enter a judgment against her you mm -hmm. know and having a party request a judgment against themselves is something that really never happens and that's what she did here and so my interpretation of that is that we are going to get a judgment entered against her mm -hmm. in which essentially she has admitted the allegations in the complaint uh, which of course associate or, or relate to a defamation and the only thing we're going to be disputing now going forward is the question of damages you know i think most people have assumed that the reason why she's doing this is because she wants to avoid discovery and, and in particular avoid discovery related to you know perhaps her actual malice or her sort of knowledge about you know what she was doing related to defaming uh, Stephen Richer you know if I'm Stephen Richer's attorneys uh, who are very good they're going to come back to this and go to the judge and say well our discovery needs to be very expansive you can't mm -hmm. just avoid discovery by doing this you know all of the things that we wanted to ask you before and find out before are very relevant to damages, particularly punitive damages. And so I think we're still going to be in a similar place where a lot of this stuff is going to eventually come out. I, I, I not only agree with Roy, again, I am not an attorney, but, you know, um, I, I think this is a seminal moment for Carrie Lake. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how this doesn't end in bankruptcy for her, personal bankruptcy, but, you know, I, I think the floor of damages is probably five million dollars and you know i've talked to some people who are like well, i want this jury just give a dollar in damages just to you know send a message i'm like no they're going to actually send a real message well what about the idea i mean this is again this is politics and you know it can get pretty rough and tumble with some of the things that people say about about other candidates and whatnot and what carrie lake is saying at this point is like yeah i said all those things Maybe I hurt your feelings, but prove to me that you've been damaged. Well, first of all, I, I would say that the proof is in, I think it's two people, more or less, who've been charged. Specifically maybe, for de for threats for against him. Death threats, not threats, death threats against Stephen Richer. And I would say that is a particularly... Uh, uh, way, uh, is a particular way to show damages here and you know I have to get security the county has to get security and my reputation you know Stephen Richard prior to this was just a normal happy conservative <laughs> now you know I mean he's got a very difficult re-election probably but more than that I, I think when you google Stephen Richard there isn't a reputational business out there that can rehab his reputation Mm -hmm. because of what has been yeah. done. I mean, I mean, I think damages are going to be significant. And, and to, to Barrett's point, you know, she has requested that a jury determine what the damages will be, yeah. right? And and that's obviously a strategy. But I think it's a strategy that's going to backfire, to, to, to Barrett's point. Well, because well, take our, our listeners here through like how a jury decides damages in a case like this. I mean, yeah. it's not like you go and say, here's my bill for you know either mental or physical uh, uh you know uh work i needed done right. how how do you determine damages if there be damages paid out in a case like this maybe walk our our listeners through that well there's different types of damages right i mean if we talk about things like actual damages we're talking about things of like loss of business loss of business reputation um the costs associated with you know responding to these false claims like barrett is talking about and you're also talking about punitive damages i mean these are damages that are essentially to punish the other person mm -hmm. uh, because they displayed actual malice in their actions right Right? Mm -hmm. So there are they are going to be enormous. And as I was saying with with Barrett's comment, um, you know, this isn't exactly the same type of case, but we've seen Dominion, for example, 
uh, who you know runs the the machine Fox right? News they, they is, sued Fox sued News Fox, Fox News. News had claimed that there was all sorts of problems with them and they got a but a billion dollar exactly. settlement they got a huge settlement or, to, to judgment to the point where you no, know it was a uh, settlement. settlement okay settlement. that's right yeah, settlement, settlement. Uh, to the point where you know Fox had to fire a bunch of people and had to sort of rejigger the way they do things uh, on the air and so I think what I'm getting at here is these types of um, lies right mm -hmm. that have been spread about elections and and the election denialism uh, that is out there, um, I don't think is going to be something that's meant sympathetically by a jury. Well, right? and we've seen Rudy Giuliani in a, in a you know, case in Georgia, I believe, was uh, against two, two poll workers there. I think it was two poll workers. Mother, daughter. Mother, daughter. And they were uh, given a judgment of 148 million dollars in a similar kind of defamation yes, and that's case. an even better example right and to the point where i think rudy has declared bankruptcy right i mean as a result of this that's that's what i recall um but obviously i mean it's well beyond what he has the ability to pay and and that's the kind of thing i think we're looking at here you know people want to th kind of buy into the hype carrie lake has pitched herself as Trump in a dress yeah. and she probably believes that but i'll tell you she does not own Trump Tower, right? She does not own a 60-story uh, apartment building or mar a lago uh, or, or golf courses and, you know, uh, clubs. She doesn't have assets to sell She does off. not have that. So she may be as bombastic or as defamatory as, say, Donald Trump has been towards certain people, but she does not have the money to back up her words. And she's going to find out real quick she is not quite Donald Trump. Donald Trump, obviously... You know, maybe there was a, an issue with because he didn't have uh, nearly half a billion dollars in cash to put up, but mm -hmm. he put up one hundred and seventy five million dollars or he's going to put up one hundred and seventy five million dollars to appeal uh, the verdict in New York. Mm -hmm. Carrie Lake, I don't know that she could put up a bond of five million or a million dollars even to appeal a verdict that she or a, uh, a damages award that she may face. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, her career, like, you know, when, how fast does this get to the jury? You know, does it get there before the primary, before the general? And if it does, are we looking at a bankrupt Carrie Lake going into the general election? Well, and just to, to piggyback on that a little bit, when we're talking about what damages or excuse me, what discovery we're going to be seeing going forward, you know, the financial position that Carrie Lake has, including where she's received compensation and how, Particularly if any of that compensation has been related to her, you know, her role as a spokesperson uh, on these types of election denial issues is going to be very relevant, I think, for calculating damages. So we're going to, I think, find out a little bit about that financial position. And how much of that stuff result. becomes public record at that point? Well, I mean, that's that's going to be up to what the because we're still because we, we are still talking about someone that's in the political arena, and that's the kind of thing that could be significant if there's public records detailing certain things like that that could come to light. Yeah, I mean, things like, you know, those kinds of private issues, I think, are going to, I mean, a judge is also ultimately going to have to decide on how appropriate that is to be released to the public. Mm -hmm. But, but at the you very know, least, she does, she has had to file some disclosures with, say, the, uh, the Senate. Yeah. Uh, you know, so some of that will have already been public, and there could be an argument that most of this is already public. So, and if it shows that maybe she didn't disclose everything, then, you know, that could be an issue as well, both mm -hmm. in the race and uh, if she were to win, you know, a, a complaint at the Senate. So there's just so many issues. And while she has expeditiously taken care of the case, I, I still think this discovery period is going to be brutal for her. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there's been a lot of speculation is in that, you know, first of all, she tried to declare, she wanted a summary judge, judgment at the beginning of this, or toward the beginning of this thing, or a few months ago. They just wanted to go get it over with real quick and easy. Now she's, you know, doing this thing that she's giving up def de a defense, admitting to all this stuff, or, it, you know, or however you want to cou uh, couch it, that she's not going to be defending her, her statements in this lawsuit anymore, and let's move to the jury to award damages, that this might be another way, have been another attempt for her to d avoid uh, discovery, correct? That there's been a lot of speculation about that, but the judge came back after she had, it, 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 it filed this paperwork, came back a couple of days later and said, no, we're going to trial with the jury 
um, and you have lost your rights to litigate the, uh, you know, every, everything in this case. That's right. And so it's not as if we're going to go forward and she's never, you know, we, we sort of just ignore the allegations in the complaint yeah. because, oh, that's done now and we can just move on and talk about damages. Like, no, those those things are going to come back. The judge is, you know, going to enter a judgment against her and it's going to be a judgment on those facts, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's essentially while well, me she may not have to literally say it out of her mouth. Um, the the judgment is going to be based on what the allegations are in the complaint as true, um, and that's how we're going to move forward. You know, and I think one thing to really pay attention to is, you know, Donald Trump really does a bang up job fundraising off of his legal issues, right? Mm -hmm. And I think Carrie Lake tried to do that um, after you know she sent out a video and she sent out a fundraising email. Uh, what did she maybe raise twenty thousand, ten, twenty thousand dollars off that email? Which is hey, great, but you know, her legal bills are piling up, and so I think what we have to watch is how much are of her legal bills are coming out of her campaign finances. Mm -hmm. And I know she also has a separate five hundred one c three or c four or whatever c four, mm -hmm. um, and so she's getting money into there and presumably probably paying some legal bills out of there. But, you know, Donald Trump, all eyes are on like how much money that Donald Trump brings in that pays for his legal fees, but he gets a, a significant amount of money. Mm -hmm. I don't think Carrie Lake gets that much money, certainly not enough to pay her legal fees. Yeah. And let's talk a little bit about the politics of the whole thing is because she still is in a Senate race. And Roy, we, we do have to disclose yep. you do legal work for the Gallego campaign. Correct. What? Uh, are you kidding I'm me? a big supporter of uh, he of discloses Barry. Oh. Uh, and I, also... I, I will disclose I do work for the Carrie Lake campaign as well. Oh, you do? Oh yeah, I, I advise her on all her best stuff. <laughs> oh man, you know how many tweets you're gonna for, get. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna for the record, <laughs> this is an edited podcast, right? No. <laughs> oh shit. So for the record, <laughs> you can you can swear for uh, the record, you're not on the Carrie Lake pay payroll. I am not okay, that on was the just Carrie a joke. Lake cake. Good Friday joke. Yeah, it was a good Friday joke. <laughs> <laughs> or a bad Friday joke. But you do you do some le you do yes. legal work for the Gallego campaign, yes. so we do have to get that out of the way there. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the politics of the whole thing. Does this hurt her at all, even with her own supporters? Because she is somebody who, as you said, Trump had addressed, doesn't want to back down, uh, do all these things. But here she is, in essence, kind of backing down in court on this. I know she's framing it differently as saying, no, we're, we're, we're turning the tables on Richard and forcing him now to show us how, how he was damaged on this. But like, does this play, how does this play politically? You know, Barrett, you're the Republican at the table here. Take us into the mind of the Republican voter. Look, that strong 35% of the electorate mm -hmm. that will back Trump or Kerry Lake, for that matter, no matter what, I don't think this really plays into it. Uh, certainly moderate Republicans, independent leaning, mm -hmm. uh, or right leaning independents, and just moderates in general, I think it will play a little bit. But this election is going to be about abortion. It's going to be about the economy and it's going to be about the border. Mm -hmm. I don't think uh, I don't think the Gallego campaign will spend too much time on this particular issue other than, hey, she's an acknowledged liar now. But I don't think this issue will play really. I don't okay. think they'll make much hay of it. Where, let me just say, say where that I do might think, play in a general though. Yeah, but where I do think this is going to potentially play is with the money people, back east. Those back east money people. I think the NRSC, the campaign arm of the Senate Republicans, and something like SLF, the Mitch McConnell line group. I think they will look real hard and really think. Is ten million dollars, twenty million dollars better spent in Montana, in Pennsylvania, in Ohio mm. to try to win the majority? I do believe this is a real problem for money from outside groups for Carrie Lake and she and the Senate Majority Pack, which is the Schumer Pack, that's uh, uh, sort of like the SLF Pack uh, on the Democratic side. You know, they're going to come in and spend ten, twenty million dollars for. Ruben Gallego. Yep. And if there isn't something on the uh, Republican side, that's a massive 
disadvantage. All right. Well, we've we got to start wrapping this up. Like I said, there's a lot to talk about, and this is the big story, and we've just been really focused on this. But, uh, you know, g- keeping with the politics thing here, um, Barrett, if, if it's okay, if you can get off your phone. <laughs> there's a podcast. We're, we're no, recording no, a podcast you know, here. Like, it's actually Carrie Lake <laughs> yeah, It's Carrie Lake. She heard the podcast. She's like, we're hey, recording a podcast I didn't, here. I didn't realize. <laughs> also, I was checking my bets. Those are also very important. Make fun of my coffee mug again. Uh, anyway, uh, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, about the Republican Party here. They announced that they're selling their headquarters in downtown Phoenix. The Republican Party has been it's been established has not been doing well financially. They're selling their headquarters downtown Phoenix like nine months after they moved into the place. Uh, they say it's a strategic move. Do you think this pretends or points to larger financial problems with the Republican Party? Well, well here's part of the problem. The Republican Party made a massive mistake selling their building at 24th and Osborne or Thomas, whatever. That building, while not exactly Taj Mahal, was a very functional building for an easily accessible building for grassroots, for party activities. And it was paid for. And they sold it. And then they, you know, were out of some office space in Scottsdale, which is probably more expensive than they needed to spend. And then... Uh, Jeff DeWitt decided, let's buy a downtown-ish, uh, uptown uh, uh, office space. Both moves were incomprehensible mm-hmm. because they had a paid-off building that needed some upgrades, for sure. There's no mm-hmm. doubt about that. But they had, it was paid off. And I, I don't understand why they moved, and I don't understand why Jeff DeWitt bought this building. Probably it is a good idea to sell this building. Whether you're cash strapped or not, I think I it's actually an fl- like, office building. It's, it's in a uh, high rise, office, yeah, right. it's, it's an office space. Building. But I, I think I read somewhere where it's a, like eleven grand a month just for the HOA, mm-hmm. and that's mm-hmm. that, that's a lot of money. You could could have sunk that eleven grand a month into uh, the twenty fourth Street uh, property and, and done some good renovations. So there you go. yeah. uh, it was a it was a mistake to get rid of that building, and now. The mistake was compounded, and now they're probably rewinding that a little bit. And, and let, yeah. let's talk. Let's, let's kind of wrap on this with uh, with Roy. We saw this week, and uh, the Republicans opening up, uh, you know, creating that committee to open up uh, to look at or investigate Attorney uh, Democratic Attorney General Chris Mays. Now they say they they cite malfeasance. They say, well, look at what she did. She didn't want to enforce a 2022 law that would have barred transgender girls from play, participating in sports. Uh, they cited. A couple of other other things out there to to look at her now the people behind this you've got in the house uh, you know ben toma uh, who's running for congress out in the west valley now in the senate you've got anthony kern um again who is an alleged fake elector who mays happens to be investigating right now um what do you make of of this play Mays has called this a political stunt. What are you making about of all this? I mean, that's exactly what it is. It is a political stunt. Um, you know, they don't like some of the actions she's taken, some positions she's taken in lawsuits. I find it a bit ironic because this argument that, you know, she's doing something wrong by not defending the laws of the state as, as they see it, when the prior Attorney General Mark Brnovich over and over again refused to defend uh, the state, the Secretary of State, uh, on election laws. Mm-hmm. I mean, when all that litigation happened mm-hmm. in, in 2020, 2022, Mark Brnovich was mostly absent, right? Uh, and it was the Secretary of State that had to defend, um, you know, the actions, uh, you know, during during those elections. So yeah. so it's, it's sort of hypo- 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 hypocritical, and, and it's all about politics at the end of the day. And I think overall, Mays is doing a good job. I mean, when we're talking about things like protecting consumers, for example, a lot of the actions she's taken, and they're just offended by that. Fair? Look, she has been an activist attorney general. Uh, particularly compared to the last one. Oh, activist. Do you agree with that label? Activist attorney general? I wouldn't say that. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I think some of her, you know, going after uh, some of the uh, uh, property managers uh, in that case, I think that's a little bit of an overreach. I'm not a lawyer, well, but well, I do think just, that's a bit of an overreach. Very <laughs> quick, though, on that, because cause this is, goes back to my point about this sort of hypocrisy here, because Brenovich took a lot of positions that I would deem as activists. I mean, think about things like, you know, the, the border, you know, related stuff that he did, immigration related stuff he did, which wasn't under his purview, but he decided to do it. And that was because of politics. Right. And so to some extent, you know, we always say activist judges, activist attorney generals. I mean, you can sort of classify anyone that way if you don't disagree with them that way. Um, but I do think going back to Mays, um, what we're seeing here is just like when we 
the Republicans in the legislature opened up the new committee on nominations for directors, you know, something that just never happened before. It's all a political game, I think yeah. they're playing. Well, I, I mean, I do agree this is a bit of a political theater, and they're as likely to find something on Chris Mays as I am to find Easter eggs at my Passover meal uh, coming up. So I don't, I think, that, and, and you know, you're also looking at it's almost April. I mean, how long is this committee even going to be around? Yeah. Um, does it really have the power to force me, you know, when they send a letter asking for records and Mays ignores it, throws it in the round file? Will they actually be able to get some records that they're looking for? <laughs> Probably not. All right, we'll have to wrap it up there. I just want to say again, you know, happy Easter for those who do observe. Um, and I uh, hope uh, everybody is enjoying their, you know, Sunday, their holidays, if they, if they hear this or whatever while we're recording. I want to thank Barrett. I want to thank Roy for joining us here today. And uh, Barrett, we'll have you back. Thank, thank you for having me on this August podcast i guess and uh he's never happy and, he's, and he's, he's, well that's just maybe one time one sometime in the near future you'll have me on the tv show again it's like prince's mother she yeah. never satisfied you have to show dennis that you own pants first before that happens. <laughs> yeah yeah i mean you're welcome back with the stipulation you must wear pants uh dennis i uh i do own a pair of pants um i just don't wear them because uh you know ever since covid it showed us that we can just kind of walk around uh, in our living rooms wearing anything we want, doing Zoom meetings. <laughs> That's a scary thought, but th th thank you for having me on, Dennis. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. And welcome back to the second half of the top Arizona political podcast, according to some. Yeah, the number one Arizona political <laughs> podcast, according to Feedspot, the Podcast Bible. Yes, yes. I'm now calling it. Yes, yes, one. yes. I, I'm a big fan. Yes, absolutely. Feed Spot? Feed Spot. They do great work. Great work over there. Love those guys. Keep, yeah. Like the hustle. Yes. Love the, yes. Colin, Colin and I, we, we enjoy the hustle. Good work. Good work, yes. Good teamwork over there, guys. Yes, and thank you for the honor. And good taste. Yes. You know, so uh, before we, or at least I, just take in the majesty of uh, the U of A, University of Arizona <laughs> loss little, in the Sweet 16. A um, little schadenfreude for me or yeah. whatever. Like Before we get into that, I, I, I do want to say, like, look, we spent the, a big chunk of the first part of the show talking about the Carrie Lake uh, defamation lawsuit, Stephen Richard uh, suit against her yeah. and the fallout from that. For, for any listeners out there or people watching on YouTube, if you're not aware, we did interview Stephen Richard this week for the TV show. Uh, so you might want to check that out. If you didn't see, uh, catch it on TV, you can check it out at our website at Arizona, uh, ArizonaFamily.com. It should be posted up there um, in quick, in short order. Um, wanted to ask you real quick, Colin, you know, you were watching it, you were producing that, that interview. What was your takeaway from Stephen Richard on this? Um. You know, the whole case has gotten so strange in that no one does what she did. So I suspect he was sort of taken aback by that. Yeah. Um, I don't think he feels he's going to have a whole lot of trouble uh, showing damages. Yeah. Um, and the whole thing is just peculiar to me. He did talk about, you asked him if he would be accept if he would still look at a possible settlement. And he says it would still require an admission mm -hmm. from her. And and it's weird because legally she's admitted she has no case. She essentially legally, is, yeah, legally. yeah. Um, so publicly she's claiming that that's not what it is at all. But legally that's what it is. And I, and I saw a quote, and I, I don't have it in front of me, but one of her campaign officials, I believe, told the Washington Post that Carrie maintains that she's been truthful about the election. Except when it comes to filings in court, when they acknowledge that that's not the case, so they or accusing Stephen Richer of you know intentionally trying to sabotage the election, right? Which is like a a, a, big, a key piece, I believe, in his lawsuit. Yes, and they acknowledged in court that that she has defamed him, and they want to go right to right to yeah. damages. And what's been sort of interesting is all along. Her supporters kept saying, oh, this is all about discovery. Got to get to discovery and all the dirt we're going to get in discovery. It's going to be great. And it appears that she's largely doing this to avoid discovery. Yeah. And it, 
judge said, you know, well, hold on, we're going, we're still going through discovery because right. now it's all about damages. Yes. And, and, and anybody wants to sum this up for their friends quickly, it's just that, look, you know, Carrie Lake has given up on, the, given up def defending uh, herself against the defamation lawsuit. All that's left is arguing over damages at this yes. point and how much money should be awarded, whether it's a dollar, 50 cents, a quarter, nothing, or significantly more than that, as Barrett Marson said. He, 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 he quoted a, a figure of $5 million, I, I think, think he said. He thought the floor was $5 million, yeah, yeah. I believe. I mean, the, the, the direct comparison, or the most direct comparison we have, I think, yeah. is the Rudy Giuliani case involving the two poll workers in Georgia, and that was $148 million. It's an insane amount of money. It is. So, bottom line, it ain't over. It's, yeah. It ain't, it ain't over. over yet. And my understanding is it's not a given that the judge even accepts this because it's, yeah. it's the move she made is a move that a plaintiff moves against a against yeah. the defendant well, or the, and, and and the judge did come back and issue that that, that uh, entered in that minute entry saying no we're moving forward to discovery right. i believe that you've lost all right to litigate yeah so we've got that piece it's it's been exhausting to follow all this and again it's not over yeah. there is still a lot to play out with this you know you have to wait and see how this plays out politically because again she is running for that U.S. Senate seat. She has some uh, opposition in the primary, but she's the heavy favorite to win. And she'll likely uh, face uh, Ruben Gallego uh, in the general election. And how this hurts her or help her. I, you know, it's 2024. You've seen a lot of this stuff in the past. It, you know, it's kind of like throwing a knuckleball. Sometimes you don't know yeah. where it's going to go. Um, you know, we've seen for Donald Trump with his indictments and his legal problems, we've seen his popularity increase with with a lot of the party. We'll see. We'll see what the reaction is with Kerry. I'm I'm skeptical that anyone because Trump is Trump is Teflon when it comes to this sort of stuff. Yeah, None it, of this. There's different political physics involved yes. when it comes to, to Donald Trump. And I'm not sure how many of those apply to Carrie Lake. Mm -hmm. Certainly with the absolute core who who believe whatever she says, mm -hmm. she'll be fine. But that wasn't enough to get her elected governor. Yep. She needs something beyond that core. And I don't think those people who wouldn't vote for her for governor are going to look positively on this. Yeah. Well, let's move on to something more fun to talk. It's yeah. been a long week. Yeah. You've worked your ass off. I've worked my ass off. Let's let's celebrate the fact that the University of Arizona Wildcats was beat yet again, falling short. <laughs> you know, and and yeah. I said this to you earlier, like I've got a lot of good friends that were really hurt again by this loss. And for them, I still feel absolute nothing. Yeah. Nothing at all. I cannot stand that school. Uh, I went to ASU, <laughs> and if I've told the story on the pod, I'm going to, before I'm sorry, I'm going to tell it again. U of A, the University of Arizona, stole my basketball coach, Lute Olson, when I was a kid growing up in Iowa, who watched, lived and breathed Iowa basketball, loved Lute Olson. And one day he was gone, and I've never gotten over it. Yeah. I should throw in a slight disclaimer that if I'm going to sit here and crap on Arizona, I should probably acknowledge that I'm an Oregon grad and we got knocked out by Creighton around earlier. But we were in a we were an 11 seed and they were a three. But seed. But you're not incorrigible. Oregon and, fans, they're so, Wildcat fans are so incorrigible. Like in football season, when their football team inevitably sucks, there's like, whoa, the basketball there's, season's there's, starting up. There is a great smugness about the basketball yes. program in Arizona that like. You know, as an Oregon fan, we're a football school. Yeah. Like, if we're having a good year in basketball, I find out around ten tournament time. Yeah. Well, I don't know. You're I like, cool. see them play until the Pac-12 tournament. It's like, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, so the statistic I saw about the University of Arizona and their tournament performance is the last six appearances they have made in the tournament, the last six appearances in the tournament, they have been knocked out. <laughs> by a team that was ranked at least four seeds worse than them. I love it. That's brutal. And I realize they always come in with a fairly high seed or typically come in with a fairly yeah. high seed. Um, 
But they still, are, man. That's they are awful. They are a great regular season basketball program. Yes. But the problem is with college basketball, it's basically a three week season. It's yeah. the tournament. Yeah. Because the quality of basketball, of men's basketball right now, is awful. Um, you, you see some of the final scores in some of these games. It's it's not a good television product anymore. No. You know, when we were younger, eh, when we were younger, God, I hate being that guy. But when you were younger, like, you know, you had stars. You knew who they were because yes. they stayed there they for three, four, year, three yes. four years. Yes. And, it, you know, there was better quality basketball because they were experienced people. Now, you know, if guys on, on the any basketball team that's a senior, it's like, wow, you really not, you're, you're not good enough to be a pro. I believe the number I heard was the average age of the University of Connecticut team is like 22.4 years old, mm -hmm. and the average age of the Oklahoma City Thunder is 22.6, <clears throat> which tells yeah. you, and and they're the top team in the West right now. Yeah, The really great players are not there at this stage. They've moved on to the NBA. Yeah. You have certainly good players who stick around yeah. in college, but it's not it's not the old days. No, it's not no, no. the best college basketball uh, product out there is the women's team, and particularly the Iowa Hawkeyes. Yes, I've yes. already disclosed my bias on that, but Caitlin Clark <laughs> Clark is awesome. Uh, but like you know, I, I've, I've watched a, you know as much more women's basketball than I have over the past three years since you've been there, and like I think it's you know, send me an email, come at me. Bro, but like the women's basketball game is a better TV product than the men. They're, they're better shooters. Well, and and we've hit a weird point because women's basketball has never really gotten that much respect no. from the public. And we are at a point now where at the college level, the average fan knows more women players than they do men's players. Yeah. Um, and in terms of the coaches, you know, college men's college basketball used to be filled with personalities as coaches, mm -hmm. whether it's Bobby Knight or even Mike Krzyzewski, who really had no personality, but will attach. Which was part of his personality. Yeah. He was he was evil because he was, you know, yeah. he was a duke. Um, but you had at least these people, you know, uh, Jerry Tarkanian was like yeah. the ultimate. Co now it's the women's coaches. I yeah, mean, it's, get... it's Kim Mulkey. Yeah, LSU, you get the Washington Post apparently has got a real humdinger of a story coming out. <laughs> but like, I cannot wait to read that she's, one. She's done a good job of selling that. I want to know who gave her, if you're not familiar, uh, she's the coach for the LSU women's team. She's very successful, won some championships at Baylor, won one last year um, uh, LSU. Um, a somewhat mouthy and controversial figure. And, uh, to quote Spinal Tap, dresses like an Australian's nightmare. <laughs> her, her fashion choices it's, are... It's like she went something else outlet. Yeah. <laughs> but um she definitely out of this world i mean but anyway uh she comes out holds a press conference blasting the washington post about a story that they've been working on yeah. like who gave her that pr advice now know. you've got you've got people that probably aren't that interested in women's basketball going Oh wait a minute! I can't wait to see yeah, this. So they're hitting refresh on the Washington yeah, Post. Yeah, yeah. To drop. I mean, like you know, do not. You know, I've got. Uh, I I've know, know a lot of people in the PR world. I sh you know, we we do that. We've yeah. both been working this damn industry for such a long time. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's. Uh, I won't name them, but they have this phrase that you don't want to break back into jail. <laughs> yes. And that's exactly what Mulkey was doing. Like you're just. You, you, you are bringing attention to a story yeah. before it. it yes. Now you've built anticipation for this. Yes, and it's a lot of it's the Streisand effect. Yeah, it's it, like it, it, God. The, you brought attention to something that most people probably wouldn't even have known it happened, but now they're all waiting for it. Now, now, now everybody, and, and, and then everybody's going to be more stories written about the story. Yeah. You know, which yeah. I lo which I love about you know it's the, the the decline of media overall in this country is you get a really great investigative story, then there's a hundred news outlets around the country that then write stories about the investigative story. Yeah, and there's going to be more of those based on this because now there's that anticipation, like what could possibly be in this thing. Well, and just the notion that they're talking to my ex players, it's going to be a hit piece. Uh, well, what exactly does that say about you? Yeah. And as a reminder, she coached uh, Brittany Griner and was asked about um, Brittany Griner being held in Russia and ultimately being released on that. She had no comment. Yeah, there was some friction between uh, Griner and, and Mulkey. Yeah. 
um, that goes back to, I, I can't remember, I, was it about her her sexuality, her being a like grinder? I, I don't being... know that anyone has said exactly what it is. Okay. But she's not fond of Brittany Griner, who won her a national championship. Yeah. Played for her, won her a national championship, and she couldn't even be bothered with a, I wish her well. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <sighs> Anyway, anyway, anyway. We, uh, that was unexpected. That's what I love yes. about these chats. Yes. You know, at the end of there, it's like, wow, yeah. we didn't, we went off on that on that tangent. And and again, it just goes to show these, you know, this is women's basketball, which we've never talked about before yeah. the last year or so. Yeah. Um, and now, like the most people couldn't name a men's coach. Somewhere. Well, who's who's the top player in in men's college basketball right now? I couldn't tell you. Who's the top player in women's college basketball Kevin right now? Clark. Yeah, see, it's like um, you know, and there's Angel Reese and um, Lou, uh, the Juju, uh, Juju at USC at USC and uh, Floje at uh, LSU as well. Okay, I think. yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, so like, Which, I, I realize we're getting like one name on some of these, but that's one more name that I can give you for the men's. Exactly. And I'm watching the games, and I don't know who these guys are. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, maybe, you know, NIL helps keep some of these kids longer, you know, instead of they're jumping to the NBA, but I doubt it. I doubt it. Um, but like, and to, people have acted like, well, Caitlin Clark's going to take a pay cut when she goes to the WI. No, she's not. Yeah. No, she's not. No. Like those state farm ads, they don't stop. When she graduates, <laughs> she will be a professional now doing state farm ads yeah. and everything else. Yeah. And, you know, hopefully and hopefully she can help grow that sport, which is which is growing well on its own. So, yeah, I mean, you've got I think so. I mean, a, a, a sports figure like that. And this is great. I mean, it's like inspiring young girls all across the country. I mean, like, look, yeah, I'm a big, I, I love Iowa, Iowa sports. I grew up right. in that state, but, you know, and I feel lucky and, and blessed, if you will, uh, that she plays for Iowa. But she's, I mean, it's been, an, she, she's got to be inspiring. It's so many young women around the country to be able to, to, to get into this and do this and to show young girls that you can make a living at this. Yes. And a pretty damn good living at this. And I've seen people suggesting, you know, and the ratings for women's basketball are going through the roof. Yeah. They're going great. And I've seen people suggesting that, well, that's a Caitlin Clark thing, and she, she leaves, and then it goes away. I don't think it does. I mean, one thing I have noticed, you know, when the, the WNBA debuted mm -hmm. 20 years ago, or whatever it was, if you watch the games, they were entertaining, but the quality of play was spotty it was a different it was a game that was played below the rim yeah at a time when the nba like was largely about athletic players and slam dunks yes and now it's different it's more, the nba is more of a three-point yeah league now and I mean, these and the and women the now WNBA, i think they sold as yeah. a well they've got the fundamentals and you'd watch the games and go yeah. Yeah, no they really they really don't and when you watch college Back in those days, it seemed like it was frequently the Harlem Globetrotters against everyone. You'd have like a UConn team yeah. in women's basketball who had all the top recruits, and they would just, you know, they would run off yeah. 60 wins without a loss. <laughs> and and what I'm seeing is those days are over. Like the, the depth yeah. of talent is dramatically better. I've been to a Mercury game. The level of play, and you've always, you know, it, it's no longer a case where you've got Tarazi and Griner, and maybe they've got a recognizable mm -hmm. name on the other side, and it's, you know, and it's strictly a supporting guest. There's an actual depth to the quality yeah. of play now. And, and plus, it's really impressive. And, and plus, you can grow the game because, you know, in, in any thing on TV, sports, whatever, you need star, you need star power. Yeah. You now you've got a legit bona fide star. Yeah. In Caitlin Clark. Yes. Uh, now the the job will be who's the next one, and it seems like the uh, the, the the woman from from USC probably is next yeah, up. Yeah, quite possibly. You know, and and Kaylin Clark didn't just suddenly come out of nowhere. There's been a line before that. I yeah. mean, Oregon had Sabrina Ionescu, who's yeah. now you know now playing for the Liberty. I mean, I'm. We a, talked about Brittany Griner. She was yes, a great college basketball yes. player. Like I'm a, I'm a dude who has a pair of signature uh, Sabrina Nike shoes. Now. There you go. Things um, I learned you about know. you. Yes. Hey, good for you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's a time. You know, it's it's arrived. It's not strictly you know, Clay, Caitlin Clark is a huge boon for the sport, but it 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 doesn't need her like it might have at some point. Yeah. 
It'll she's just adding to it. Her, but she's adding to yeah. a pretty solid product. You yeah. look around the league, and there are teams with really good, recognizable names. You know, If you follow basketball at all, you'll know a lot of the names on a lot of teams around yeah. the WNBA. Yeah. Well, let's shift a little bit to now, now to uh, you know another uh, uh, great topic of ours, baseball. Yeah. Opening day. Yeah. Diamondbacks won, was it 16-1? Yeah, they had a 13 run inning, did I see? And by I see, I mean I read that somewhere because I don't have the games on. See, they're on pace TV. to win 162 games yeah. as of this recording yeah. right now. Yeah. And Season's my over. are on, on pace for 0 oh, for, for 162, which is a much more legitimate possibility <laughs> than the D backs got 160 though. Um, I think this D bag team is a better team than it was last year, talent wise, pitching wise. Will they have the kind of success and go on the kind of run that they did next year? Oh, last year, it's a big I, ask. That's a it's a big question mark. Yes, would love to see it. Would be happy to see them grow on what they did regular season wise last year. Yeah. You know. Um, that was a fairly magical run. And, and I was just going to, to say, to build on that. like you're never going to, even if you went back this year, it wouldn't be exactly the same as last year yeah. because it was so unexpected. Like every, every game, every series that they advanced on was like a gift to you as a sports yes. fan, because you know, it just, you know, it was like, you weren't supposed to be here. Like, you know, yeah. it started the, you know, so I'm really excited. I do think this is a better team uh, last year. But then again, it seems like all the other teams in the West and the NL West got better as well, including yeah. the dreaded Dodgers. Including the Dodgers. Um, I, hope, I hope there's some real dirt with the Shohei thing. <laughs> and it, it causes a problem for them in the clubhouse all season long. See, um, I'm assuming Shohei's going to be fine and there's nothing else that's going to come out. Simply because he left the Angels as a free agent, mm -hmm. and this broke, and it's so on brand for someone to join the Angels and then have you know, and then be a disaster mm -hmm. on a big contract. The fact that he left the Angels and went somewhere else, I think he's going to be fine for the Dodgers. <laughs> <laughs> if he stayed with the Angels, then we would have found out these are all his bets, and you know. Yeah. So, what are your predictions? World Series. Uh, I mean, Dodgers, um, they keep losing. They get swept by the Diamondbacks, but you look at the rosters and how much they're spending, and mm -hmm. it seems like betting against the Dodgers at any point is a sucker's bet. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, you know, I think baseball is built up. It's, it's a two-season two sport now in one. You've got the regular season, and certainly Dodgers are built to win a lot of games yes. in the regular season. Yes. Are they going to... Are they built, and will they be healthy enough to go on a run in the postseason? Yeah. And they've shown, the Dodgers have shown the past several years, the answer is no. Yeah. And there have been all sorts of teams that have been assembled out of, you know, multi-million dollar parts that you look at and think, this team's unbeatable. And they proved to be eminently beatable. Yeah. You know, the Mets have tried it, and the Mets are garbage. Yeah. I mean... Postseason is about do you have two great starters? You can get a, a long way. You can go a long way with that. And yeah. the Dodgers have shown that they're 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 pitching as suspects, it, to say to be kind in in the postseason. And it's just for some reason whatever you know for whatever whatever helped them in the regular season it doesn't translate to the postseason. Yeah. So you know I'm I'm kind of hopeful. I, I I hope you know uh, D Baskin you know when. 85, 90 games this year. That'd be great. And then, you know, see what happens. Yeah. I mean, I think the addition of Jordan Montgomery is a big deal. Yeah. Um, you know, he, he played for the Cardinals. He played for the Rangers last year in their world champions. He's been a solid, he's a solid, like, number three pitcher. And he really bolsters that. Uh, question will be, you know, the bullpen again, can you get that repeat performance? Yeah. Because remember, that bullpen was dog shit last year i remember yes. watching them in july and august going oh we're circling the drain and then they got their act together yeah by the end of the season they were solid they got their yeah and you know so we'll we'll see where that was at i mean baseball the the, the good and bad thing about baseball is it's so, it's such a long season yeah you know <laughs> it really is 162 it really games is. man I mean, that's crazy yeah so anyway man anything else you wanted to hit no i think that probably covers it all right i hope you've enjoyed your good friday taping yeah any big Easter plans? 
No, I'm gonna. Sp- I'm gonna I think I'm gonna chill with my dog. I, yeah. I just adopted a dog. See, all right. So if you're looking for something to do, because we have the family has one Easter tradition every year, is the Easter bone hunt, which is we take the little milk bones, and we we put the dog in the oh. in the house and close the blinds, and we go out in the backyard and we hide the bones all over the yard, and then open the door and let her rip. And I mean, she knows what's coming. She knows what we're doing. She's oh, that's been awesome. through the process. And she just goes tearing through the yard. That's awesome. Little milk bones. That's yes. awesome. Easter I might do that. Yeah. I might do that. Yeah. A solid tradition. See ya. Thanks for listening. You can subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, the Google Store, or anywhere else you get your podcasts. See you next time.